Welcome to Your Lifestyle Is Your Medicine podcast, where we do deep dives into topics of mind, body, and spirit. Now, through these conversations, you'll hear practical advice and effective strategies to improve your health and ultimately add health span to your lifespan. I'm Ed Padgett. I'm an osteopath and exercise physiologist with a special interest in longevity. Now, today, my guest is Eric Hinman, five times Ironman triathlete, brand builder, health and wellness entrepreneur, and someone who walks the walk and talks the talk. Now, Eric is focused on creating the best life he can for himself and his community, which includes the companies and brands that he is part of. Now, if you haven't seen Eric's Instagram, it's at Eric Hinman. You really should, because you can spend a few minutes on there and you'll get a pretty good idea what Eric stands for. Now, Eric and I share a mutual interest and excitement in curating the best lives possible for your mental, physical, and spiritual health. So in today's episode, Eric and I are going to take a deep dive into how he went from being a slightly out of shape insurance salesman to a brand influencer he is today. We'll get into the health and fitness routines he's built over the years and how he managed to create a living from a job that didn't even exist 10 years ago. Now, hopefully, coming away from today's episode, you'll get some great ideas about what you can do in your day to add health span to your lifespan. So Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Edward. I appreciate it. No problems. So, I mean, there's so many different places that we can start this, but I feel like anyone who's listened to my show for a while will understand that I use the tenets of lifestyle medicine to, uh, to add structure to things. So I want to go through those tenets with you and see how you've built your life around, or not necessarily around these tenants, but with these tenants in mind. And so the first tenant is physical activity or exercise. And you know, I know that is a huge part of your life, but how did you go from being, like I said, the slightly out of shape insurance salesman to who you are now? Yeah. So, uh, you know, of all of the different tenants, as you're calling them, I think exercise has yielded me the most return on time invested in moving. Um, and I also feel my best uh, from exercise. And I feel like exercise also is one of those tenants that is going to positively impact a lot of other tenants, like getting enough sleep, um, you know, having a positive attitude, having stress resilience, eating healthy. So I'm glad that you started with exercise because mm -hmm. I think that is the number one pillar for me um, to live a life of health and wellness. So, um, you know, I've had various transitions over the years of what exercise means to me. Um, in high school, it was very much about team sports and winning basketball games and trying to win cross country meets and winning the, the mile race and, and track. And I never really enjoyed practice during those years. It was more about the competition side of things, just like really trying to shine and, and trying to, to beat others. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got into weightlifting in college and after college, and it was very vanity based. It was bench press and bicep curls curls and shoulders and no functional movements outside of maybe some of the pressing movements, but you know, there was no squatting or deadlifting. It was right. all just to have, you know, pecs and to have biceps, which I thought were the important muscles to get girls. Mm -hmm. um, and then after college, I started in my first career, which was insurance. And I was sitting in a car driving 50,000 miles a year. And you know, I went from maybe 170 in, in college, you know, fairly lean to 200 pounds and having a little gut, you know, sitting so much, not eating healthy, not having an understanding of what healthy eating was, not having understanding around purposeful exercise and, you know, muscle mass and VO2 max and all of these things that, you know, are fitness, not just an aesthetic of having muscle. So in my mid twenties, I hired a personal trainer who helped get me back on track. And, you know, I had accountability to him because it was in my calendar every day. I was paying him to train me. And after doing that for about a year, I got into a really good rhythm and also started to really understand, you know, what functional fitness was. He had me doing deadlifts and squats mm. and he had me doing a lot of cardio in between the strength training so i was doing crossfit before i ever knew what crossfit was and so but it's still you know kind of vanity based of like i want to look like i'm fit you know it I, I was starting to be mindful of you know that post exercise endorphin rush during that time period but i was still not eating super healthy i was still drinking on the weekends so you know i was still using alcohol to fuel mm -hmm. vulnerability and to fuel conversation and to fuel you know community and meeting people 
And then I got into triathlon. I signed up for a sprint triathlon because a bunch of my friends in Syracuse, New York had bought these fancy bicycles that had four handlebars on them. And I was intrigued by, by the bike. And I'm like, I want one of those. What are you guys doing? And they're like, we're doing a half Ironman. I'm like, what is a half Ironman? And they told me the distances of swimming 1.2 miles, biking 56 miles and running a half marathon. And, you know, at this point, I don't think I had run more than maybe seven miles. And I'm like, really, you can do that as a human. <laughs> So I bought the bike and started training for this sprint triathlon. And, you know, I almost drowned in that first triathlon because I had no swimming background. Um, but it was really empowering. I'm like, this is a fun sport. I love the camaraderie and energy and, you know, the people that the sport attracted, just people looking to, you know, push the ball forward and you know, people who wanted to be the best version of themselves physically and mentally. Um, so I signed up for an Olympic distance and then a half Ironman. After my first half Ironman, I told my girlfriend at the time I would never do that again. No. And then like 30 minutes later, I'm like, I think I might do a full Ironman next year. <laughs> it's amazing how the sport just sucks you in if, you know, you're a type A personality of, you know, just wanting to see what you're capable of. Um, I did a full Ironman, um, just missed qualifying for the world championships by one minute in one place in wow. my very first Ironman. And then uh, I did two more Ironmans and in Lake Placid, qualified for Kona both years. And uh, that was 2010 to 2015. And, you know, during those years, that's when my life really began to change because I had so much time alone, biking, uh, running, swimming, um, and also so much time where, you know, I had high serotonin levels mm -hmm. and my mind was just so clear. And I realized that, uh, the exercise was fueling the best version of myself. I was, you know, attracting opportunities. I was really coming out of my shell and just like shining through with my passion and purpose in life. I realized I was positively impacting a lot of other people and in inspiring them to exercise, eat healthy, you know, sleep, do, do these recovery protocols. So, you know, it went from wanting to like get to Kona to see how fast and how far I could push this to being the best version of myself and using all of these self-care practices to get there every day. And ultimately just like designing this, what I call my perfect day. Um, so, you know, it went from very ego and vanity based to like soul satisfying. And I love doing this because my cup is so full, it's overflowing and I'm able to positively impact others because I got to this place. So, you know, it was an evolution of, you know, that transition and an evolution of, you know, going from having a nine to five and, you know, working on the weekdays and playing on the weekends to like living my life exactly the way I wanted to with exercise fueling a lot of that. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I just want to pick out a couple of points there. So this is like a 20 year journey. Is that right? From yeah, this when you first started? To, yeah, this I'm 42 years old now, 25, 26 is when I hired that personal right. trainer. 28 is when I did my first um, triathlon and by 29, 30, I was doing half Ironmans and full Ironmans. So yeah. Yeah, we're talking 15 years 15 of years. habit stacking. All right. So if someone does go on your Instagram, I want them to know that uh, well, your physique that you have at the moment, the lifestyle you have is a culmination of 15 years of, uh, of application as opposed to just an overnight thing. Yep. Because one of the things I've, I've noticed is that you, when, when you mentioned there, you, you wanted to get fit for vanity reasons and that's a perfectly valid reason for, for some people but you hired a coach and that coach gave you the direction and then that coach led you to or also your training probably led you to meeting these people with the bikes and then that gave you a more structure so it's this structure that you put yourself in with other people guiding you that helped you get to um to Kona essentially Yep. hundred percent. Yeah. I had uh, the personal trainer and then all throughout my triathlon years, I, I also had a triathlon coach right. um, who input all of my workouts and, you know, I would track all of the workouts on my watch and upload them to the platform called training peaks. So mm. yeah, I think accountability, um, structure, 
And, you know, having purpose with every single session is so instrumental in achieving anything in life. Yeah, I think you're 100% right. Training Peaks is, I've just found Training Peaks, actually. It's really good. I'm, Great platform. I'm, yeah, I'm trying to get into some more ultra distance running and uh, having it there, it's, you know, it's reminding me what to do and what data is do it and, and to see uh, the little green boxes start to get completed when you uh, yeah. complete your workouts. It's actually really good. But I, I think the, the advice that I'm sort of picking up from you is that th having a coach and having a, a purpose and having a, a structure can make the exercising part of your day and part of your life, but also help you achieve goals that you may, uh, may not even know you can achieve at the moment. Like you said, people can, what did you say? People can actually run that distance or do that humanly. It's possible. Yeah. And then, and then you yeah, it's a, a half iron man. It seems impossible. And then a full iron man and yeah. amazing. Um, so with, with, with your exercise, that's taken us up to the end of your Ironman period, but now you're doing something different. Is that correct? It is. Yeah. Now my days are, you know, strength training, anaerobic conditioning, accessory work, which all of that bundled together is CrossFit training. Mm -hmm. um, and then I do some type of aerobic activity every day, running, rucking, trail running, mountain biking, road cycling, about 60 to 90 minutes of each of those. So 60 to 90 minutes of strength training and anaerobic conditioning in the morning, and then 60 to 90 minutes of aerobic activity in the um, early afternoon. And then I have a recovery routine that I do every single night, which is three rounds of 20 minutes in a hot barrel sauna and five minutes in a ice barrel in the cold plunge. Um, and that allows me to back up that exercise volume day in and day out. And, you know, I still compete here and there. I do the CrossFit open every year. I get close within my age group, getting to the CrossFit games. Um, I do high rocks competitions, which is a, a series of running and functional workout stations. It's about an hour time domain. Um, but, you know, I, I do all of this so much more now for my mental and emotional mm. well-being. I just know that after I hit that morning workout, my mind is going to be clear. I'm going to be creative. I'm going to have really good conversations with people. I'm going to do good work. And then the same holds true after the afternoon aerobic session and after um, after the recovery session. And with all of those, too, I'm doing it with people now. So, you know, I'm, I'm building community mm. and there's camaraderie and you know, that also fuels a lot of my happiness too, or the people I get to do this with. That's beautiful. So for someone um, listening to this, they might be like, okay, he said two hours in the morning, an hour in the afternoon, and then a recovery session. That's quite a lot of time to, to, to exercise. And I know it's taken you a long time to build your life around this almost all your life has kind of evolved from this. But how do you, how do you find the time to do all that? Yeah. So, I mean, now that is my work. So um, I work with about 20 different brands, creating content for them, helping them build out their ambassador programs, um, seeding product for them, connecting them with distribution channels and investors, um, event companies. Um, so, you know, a lot of what I'm doing, I'm also now able to monetize as opposed to separating exercise from my work hours. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm shooting content around the exercise, shooting content around the sauna and the cold exposure sessions. Um, the people I'm surrounding myself with, um, are generally also content creators. So, you know, there's this, you know, co-mingling of mm -hmm. work and self-care protocols, um, that I'm able to monetize most of my day doing that. You know, we also host retreat, retreats here at the property. I co-host retreats. So, you know, those are basically going to be another day in the life, just having 10 people come and, and do that with us. Wow. Okay. So with the lifestyle medicine, we've got exercise, we've got nutrition, we've got stress management, we've got toxic, avoiding toxic substances, and we've got community and building community. And so I want to unpack that a little bit. So you're your role at the moment, the way you you um, provide income for yourself is as a brand ambassador. Is that correct? It's correct. Yeah. Okay. A brand ambassador, but also, you know, a consultant to the brands having right. built businesses myself. Um, you know, I'm, I'm helping them build their business. And how did that how did that even start? How do you someone go from being an insurance salesman, triathlete, uh, you know, good, good triathlete, uh, CrossFit competitor to now actually making an income or a living from building brands. 
Yeah, I mean, I think each of those chapters, I was able to build skills that translated to what I'm doing now. So, you know, in the insurance years, I learned the skill of selling and building relationships and building that business. Um, with triathlon, I learned grit. I learned um, how to, you know, be an athlete. And um, I also learned how to impact people's lives um, through self-care protocols. And then um, early in the ambassador, um, my, my role as an ambassador for these companies, it was very much just, you know, posting pictures on social media for mm -hmm. them. And then I realized like, wow, I have this massive network of amazing people that I can open up to all of these brands. I have this network of investors I've met over the years. I have this network of, um, you know, distribution channels, whether it's grocery stores, uh, shoe stores, whatever, where I can help these brands get their product in front of even more customers. And I have a lot of friends in this space that I can seed product to. So, you know, over the years, I've kind of carved out my own niche within this world of influencer marketing, where I'm wearing, you know, like five or six different hats for the companies I'm working with. Uh, and ultimately, having been a business owner, I realized that, you know, if, if a company is spending marketing dollars, they want a return on investment. Mm -hmm. So I think of all of the ways I can provide a return on investment for the companies I'm working with. And they like that, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I think it differentiates me from a lot of other people in the space that, you know, that just think the number that next to their name is going to continue getting them paid. And, you know, I realized that if someone pays me, then I have to, you know, make sure that they're getting a return on that yeah. money they paid me so that we keep the relationship strong. Yeah. Beautiful. And do you have a way of selecting the brands you work with? Is there a theme amongst them all? Yeah, I mean, the majority of them are going to be in the health and wellness space. They all weave in with my day. Um, I like knowing the founders of the companies so I can build that relationship with them. You know, I have this fly to Tokyo rule where, you know, would I fly to Tokyo with the people I'm working with? You know, I want to make sure that it's a, it's a really good relationship and I enjoy those relationships because, Life is just too short to, uh, you know, to interact with people that you don't want to be interacting with on a regular basis. Um, I like picking companies that are smaller up and coming so that I'm adding value for my audience of exposing my audience to, you know, the latest and greatest. And I also feel like the smaller companies, I can have more impact. You know, if mm. Nike hires me, like I'm just a billboard for them. I don't feel like I'm moving the needle, but, you know, a smaller brand that's just raising their first round of funding mm. and I can help expose the brand to people that are going to be interested in it. I can expose that brand to investors. I can link them up with distribution channels. I can introduce them to CrossFit and Ironman and High Rocks, different events. Like I can really move the needle for them. So, you know, that feels of value to me and I feel good about relationships like that. So that's how I pick the brands that I work with. Interesting. I want to put you on the spot here. Can you think of a brand that you've, um, that working with you has really helped them as well as helped you? Uh, do you have any, anyone that success stories bring to mind? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of them. Ice Barrel is one where the founder of the company, Wyatt, reached out to me back in 2018. And he had just gotten into cold exposure and he had created this wood wine barrel that he was getting in for his cold exposure. Mm -hmm. And he sent me one and I just loved his vision for what the company could become. And, you know, now, you know, I think they sell around 20 or 30 ice barrels every single day and the yeah. product has evolved. They've, you know, they have a team of 15 people. They have this beautiful warehouse and manufacturing facility that they've partnered with in Ohio. Um, so it's been cool. I love seeing entrepreneurs that just have this passion, turn it into a business and then develop this amazing product and then build a brand and community around it. So mm -hmm. Ice Barrel is one of those where I was with them from day one and got to see this whole evolution and, you know, we'll continue to see this evolution of, of where they go with it. So, I mean, that's a perfect example of the mm -hmm. companies I like to work with where, you know, I really feel like I was able to add tremendous value. And now it's cool to see that they're feeding 15 people and, you know, that they've been impacted thousands of people's of lives with cold exposure mm. Mm. and that ripple effect that those people who do the cold exposure will have in their communities as well it's it's a nice exactly. feeling to to know that you're part of that uh to sort of ask about the cold exposure so I, I i do that as well i've converted a freezer and it, the ice barrels this is a, sort of a technical thing the ice barrels do you fill them up like every time or do they somehow keep the water in and then how does it keep clean 
That's my, one of my yeah. questions. Yeah, I mean, that, there's a number of ways to answer that based on variables. Um, right now, it's cold in Denver, Colorado, so yeah. you can leave the water in quite a bit longer than in the summer. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not going to get warm and, you know, stagnant. Uh, so this time of year, I'm only changing it every two or three weeks. I put salt in it. I put a water stabilizer in it. Mm -hmm. I don't have to run any kind of chilling unit. I don't run a pump or, or filter or anything through it right now. Um, so every two to three weeks, I change it. Mm -hmm. um, in the summertime, if you do not have a pump and filter and chilling unit for it, every three or four days yeah. you need to empty it and refill it um and you know if it's 90 degrees and you have six people going in and out of it you're gonna have to get ice almost every single day for it yeah. or get an ice machine um but there are these pumps chilling unit and filter systems now that you can connect to the ice barrel a stock tank and mm -hmm. you know if you want to spend a little more there's you know, whole integrated systems mm -hmm. that you could buy that have all of it. So you don't have to change the water at all. And we do have one ice barrel here that's connected to the chilling unit pump and filter um, ice barrels coming out with their own uh, proprietary system here within the next nice. three to four months. So, you know, then, you know, you won't have the problem of having to constantly change the water or yeah. put ice in it, which will be nice for people. Yeah, really nice people. Yeah, I did uh, to, to convert the freezer. I had to sort of figure out some of this stuff myself with the filters. Yep. And then I use ozone to, to stop it from smelling yep. too much. And, and you're right, you, you start getting like people want to come to my house and do the ice bath, which is great. But then the more people I have in it, the more I'm like yeah. becoming the pool boy and like maintaining it the whole time. So yeah, actually, I, had a, I had a friend who, who carved out out of a fallen tree an actual bathtub and we occasionally use that and what we do is we, wow. take, we take the water out of the cold out of my freezer and just fill up the bathtub with it and then i get people like 10 people go through there no problems it's just one night sessions you know i love it it's cool seeing you know all of these different homemade systems i have a lot of friends that have made their own systems in colorado and elsewhere and I love it. I love the creativity with it. And you're right. You know, if you just hop on YouTube, like you can find a lot of cool homemade systems mm -hmm. that are not all that expensive yeah. and work really, really well. So I always encourage people like get cold however you want. And if mm -hmm. you can figure out, you know, how to build your own, if you're handy, then that's a great way to go with it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're talking about cold and the benefits of cold, but someone might be listening to this and going, why would you do that? Can you tell us a little bit about why you go in the cold tub? Yeah, you know, kind of like exercise, my why for it has definitely changed over the years. You know, initially it was very physical based. It was to reduce inflammation so I could, you know, continue training at a high level without, you know, waking up in the morning and having aches and pains. And I, I realized though over the years that the mental benefits for me were even greater than the physical benefits. So, you know, I, I like to explain it as, you know, you could have a day where everything is just getting derailed and you have this massive to-do list and everything feels like it's stacking up vertically on your head and the weight of the world is on your shoulders. And if you hop in 40 degree water for three to four minutes after that, you feel like that massive to-do list on the top of your head is all of a sudden just laid out nicely in front of you and you can just mm -hmm. tiptoe, tiptoe over it. Um, so, you know, what it's doing is it is boosting your serotonin levels when you're in the cold, it's activating that fight or flight mode. And um, that's the reason for that post cold high that you get. It's very mm -hmm. similar to that post exercise endorphin rush with a lot less time um, and a lot less effort uh, having to put forth. You just have to, you know, bear it for three to four minutes. Yeah. And afterwards, you're going to feel energized. You're going to have mental clarity. Um, you're because of it boosting your adrenaline, you're going to have this, you know, two to five hour um, window of uh, additional focus and alertness. So, you know, for all of those reasons, that's why I do it day in and day out is mm -hmm. the mental and emotional benefits that I get from, from it and the stress resi resilience component. So, you know, it, it takes a lot now for something to stress me out because I've exposed myself to these good stressors so often. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. And some people uh, find the benefits during the day and some people find the benefits before bed. And, and um, you're right. It has the adrenaline spike. Uh, and personally, I, I found I pushed it towards my bedtime and, and it helps me sleep better. Um, even yeah. though there's a bit of an adrenaline there, it seems to flush out of my system quite quickly, which is definitely yeah. yeah i do mine typically between like 4 and 6 p.m mm -hmm. um you know it's generally at least four hours after that strength training workout in the morning so i'm not interfering with any of those hypertrophy you mm. know gains that i would want to get from strength training 
Um, but ultimately, I, I feel like it's best to incorporate it when it fits with your schedule, when yeah. you can do it on a consistent basis, kind of like exercise, like just having a block of time in your day when it works for you to be able to do it. And I, I, I find it's much more enjoyable doing it with friends. So, you know, from four to six, that's a time period when most people here, they're done with their work day, they can come over and do it with me. So we like combining it with, you know, the community aspect of it and, you know, allowing others to come to our place and, and do it here. Beautiful. So there's two, there's two, there's two components right there, stress management and building community. You're doing that with the ice bath, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, what we haven't talked about is how do you fuel yourself? I mean, there's a lot of calorie expenditure happening here and uh, you've, you've been at this sort of high level of, of exercise for a long time. So tell me about what you eat. Yeah, again, it's changed through the years and it uh, continues to evolve. So um, at this current moment, I am tinkering with uh, the Paul Saladino mil- uh, meat, fruit, um, organic raw mm. honey, uh, raw milk diet. Yeah. Um, he's, he's, just, down, he's down here. He's well, he's in Costa Rica. I mean, I'm in Nicaragua, which is just above. Oh, no so, way. Yeah. yeah. So he's, he's just over the border. Yeah. I yeah so I'm, I'm, I'm experimenting with, yeah. uh, with that diet right now, but yeah. you know, I think animal based is a good way to start, mm. um, you know, eating, uh, organic, foods that you would find in nature, you know, Mm. that you would either pick harvest, uh, or, you know, kill. I think that is the best way to go. And for me, I build my calories throughout the day. Um, so I generally am eating lighter in the morning and early afternoon. And then dinner is when I consume the majority of my calories. And that's more for mental clarity. I've realized that for me, there's a direct correlation between food volume and, and energy and mental mm. clarity. And, you know, I, I want just enough calories in my system to be able to p- perform physically and mentally, but not so much that I feel bogged down. And if I have, you know, a big steak at lunch, then I just kind of feel like it zaps my energy and zaps my mental clarity some. Mm. So I'm typically doing, you know, eggs or fruit and smoothies earlier in the day. And then in the evening, that's when I'll have either steak or grass fed, grass finished burgers, salmon, chicken thighs, and then some kind of carb right now, you know, that being fruit, but Mm. historically that's also been rice or potatoes. Mm. Um, I'm probably in the three to 4,000 calorie range. I don't count it. Um, I just know I stick to a similar structure of eating the same things around the same times each day. Um, and there are things I look forward to and there are things that, um, again, like are fueling mental and physical performance. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I don't entirely avoid desserts or entirely Mm -hmm. avoid, you know, uh, you know, ice cream, but you know, that's a very small percentage of what I consume. And that would only be consumed in the evening when, you know, I know that all of my cognitive and physical tasks are done for the day. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people struggle with, uh, getting their diet tuned in either it's family pressure that traditionally they eat you know to, to uh, meat and two veg in the evenings or they eat a lot of pasta and so on so you're shifting to this more carnivore um or sort of animal product plus fruit plus honey how does that work in your family in your community do p- people support you or do you fight a battle to do that yeah, I mean, my friend group over the years, dating back to Iron Man, really changed. Um, I have very few friends that drink. I have very few friends that, you know, go to bars or go out late at night. Um, I have very few friends that are pestering me with like, hey, just come over and have some donuts. You know, the right. majority of my friends now have been on a similar journey to mm-hmm. me and understand the importance of you know, fueling your system with healthy organic foods and what that's going to do for your physical and mental performance. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think your environment, the people you surround yourself with are ultimately going to dictate a lot of your reality and a lot of either your success or, you know, failure in life. So I think it's very important to be cognizant of who you're surrounding yourself with, um, what your environment is, you know, I'm in Denver, Colorado, which is a very active city. Mm -hmm. People move here for a reason because they like being outside. So that's generally going to attract a certain, you know, breed of human. Um, and also like our home, we have set up in a way that it just begs us to live a healthy lifestyle. 
Um, we have multiple water dispensers throughout our house with spring water. Mm -hmm. um, we keep our pantry, freezer, fridge stocked with only animal-based products. Um, we turfed 1,200 square feet of our backyard and built an outdoor gym. We have multiple saunas, multiple cold plunges, red light therapy, PEMF mats. Uh, I mean, you name it. It is just like a biohacking hub. So um, and that was, you know, a very conscious effort to design an environment that just begged us to, you know, move and recover and live this super healthy lifestyle. I love it. I love it. A lot of people will put their exercise equipment in the basement and then they'll shut the door to the basement and they'll yeah. never go down there again. We, we used to have um, a infrared sauna and uh, my wife was like, well, let's put it in the basement. And I said, well, you know, you know what happens when things go in the basement. No one uses those. So we put it in our bedroom, but it was so big that we had to walk around it and basically sort of shuffle past it every time we got it out of bed. And so yeah. it reminded us to use this thing all the time because it was in our face. And you're right, the environment you create, it, it feeds those habits. And, and it's very easy for a lot of people to, to sort of think of exercise as separate in their lives. You know, they're like, there's my gym over there, but my living room or wherever it is is, is built for comfort. And I think that blending like you've done, like your backyard is a gym and you've got those the recovery stations all around, that blending of lifestyle it, for, for movement exercise is so important. And I commend you for that. Thank you. Yeah, and also for content creation, yeah, I just wanted to make it easy to you know, live out all of those roles I have in life. So the easier yeah. you can, you can make your life by designing your environment, the you know, better off you're going to be. And yeah, I, I just think we all suffer from decision making fatigue. So if you can just build all of these positive habits throughout your day and design your environment around positive habits, you're going to eliminate a lot of the decision making fatigue. I love it. And it's the same when you have that personal training, you mentioned this earlier that he was in your calendar. So you had no choice. It was like something you had to do. And um, we used to own a clinic back in Canada and we had a, a, the first uh, natural movement gym, MoveNat with Erwin McCall. We were the first guys in Canada to have a gym. And uh, my wife and I were like, this is great. We're going to do exercise every day. There's a class. We put the class in at the end of our day and we didn't go because it was optional for us to go. We weren't paying for it. It was optional. And we thought that's weird. We've built this gym. We've got this class happening right at the right time, but we always seem to fill it up with things that you know weren't that important. So what we did is we shifted the instructors to be us. So we had to teach that class at that time. And we had no choice apart from to be in it. And then we would work out with everyone at the same time. Love so it. it's, it's, it's right. It's, that, it's like you just you know your weaknesses sometimes and trick yourself into doing it uh, and build it in as part of your day. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. So we've, uh, we've talked about your exercise, talked about your food, how you fuel it. We talked a little bit about your recovery, but can we go a bit deeper into that? So do you, do you do anything in particular for sleep? Uh, I mean, a lot of what we've talked about is definitely going to mm -hmm. fuel deep sleep, um, exercise, the sauna sessions, the cold exposure, eating healthy, um, but specific to sleep, the things I would do, probably the most impactful thing for me is avoiding highly stimulating environments late at night. So, um, you know, not going to a 10 PM concert where there's bright lights and you're just heavily stimulated, um, not entertaining a lot of people late into the evening. Um, we were typically doing our dinner around five 30 or six and, you know, people have left by seven and, you know, I have a good hour and a half or so to wind down before bed to just ease my mind. So it's not, um, continuing to think right when you go to bed, um, sleeping in a dark environment, you know, if you can't control that, getting a sleep mask, if you can control that, you know, get just having a black blacked out mm -hmm. room. Um, we set our temperature to 63 degrees in the evening. So a cool environment. I wear earplugs um, so that, you know, no sounds wake me up. Uh, I have a fan blowing on me just to have some airflow. Uh, we have a chili pad on our oh. sleep mattress. So we yeah. set our temperature of, of the bed in the evening as yeah. well. Uh, again, just like a cool environment. Um, we use attitude sheets, which we really like just to wick away heat. You know, I think the heat component is huge. Um, doing the sauna in the evening is super beneficial for sleep because your body is going to be working hard to cool itself down before um, bedtime. Mm. And there's this natural rhythm that occurs in your system of your body, you know, needing to cool itself so you can get to sleep and then your body warms itself in the morning. 
um, doing highly stimulating things early in the morning, getting outside, looking at uh, looking at the sun, um, cold exposure or a workout in the morning just to set up that cortisol release early so that you're not releasing cortisol later in the evening. Um, all of those things have, have helped me with, with sleep. Um, we do a sleep tonic every night. It's called Bean Dream. And uh, I mix that in with goat milk and a little honey. I found that honey, just like a teaspoon, um, helps me in the evening. It helps calm my mind. And I don't wake up with any hunger pangs um, by having the, that teaspoon of honey before bed. Do you, know, do you know why that might be with honey? Um, it's, it's glycogen. So I think it helps with your pituitary gland um, so that, you know, your, your glycogen levels are topped off. So you don't, you know, get up at three in the morning with mm. this hunger. Yeah, interesting. So I like the way you structured that. There's the sleep, you know, when I ask people about sleep, it's all about what they do in the evening, but also it's the morning. The morning sets you up for the good sleep in the evening. And Definitely. getting out there and seeing that sunshine, like you said, it's that changes those hormones so that you can uh, be set up for your evening. We you also mentioned a chili pad, and, and I've got a chili pad. For, for those people who don't know, chili pad is like a mattress topper that runs cool water through it. So you can set up at whatever temperature you want, and you can set it to change the temperature throughout the night to do with your body clock. And I think that's brilliant. So I was thinking about what I do. You're like, yeah, earplugs, check. Uh, eyes, eye mask, check. Chili pad, check. Fan, check. What about mouth tape? Have you, have you experimented with that? I haven't tried that. No. Um, Mark Bell, the, the bodybuilder, he just sent me some of his hostage tape to try, right. but I, I haven't tried it yet. I'm, uh, I'm intrigued with it though. Yeah. It's like the, the breathing through your nose, uh, as you probably know, has, has many benefits for your, um, for the, for your health and for the way you breathe. But there's these studies that show if you breathe in through your nose and just out through your mouth, which can happen when, you know, people are sleeping, the humidity that's needed to keep the nasal passage clear is actually going out of your mouth, not out, not out, back out of your nose. And mm. so within about four or five minutes, your nose starts to, to narrow and you end up not being able to breathe at all through your nose and just through your mouth. And so mm. there's uh, an interesting research to suggest that we should go in and out through our nose as opposed to a circular way of breathing. And I think that's what the mouth tape, well, it, mouth tape, there's many things, but one of the things would be that. Fascinating. But yeah, give it a go. Why not? Well, I have the tape. Yeah, I need to try it. <laughs> So another tenant of uh, lifestyle medicine is this avoiding toxic substances. And you've mentioned that already, that, that your friend group uh, aren't really into uh, partying and beer so much, uh, probably no smoking. What about any other toxic substances that, um, you know, I'm struggling to think of anything, but there could be uh, recreational drugs, that kind of thing. Is that something that you avoid or that you partake, partake in? Yeah, it's something I avoid. And, you know, this dates back to my late 20s when, you know, I, I never went cold turkey on alcohol, but I might have a glass of wine a year. My rule of thumb is unless it's going to greatly enhance the experience, then, you know, no bueno for me because I know how much it's going to affect my sleep. I know how much my sleep is going to affect my ability to perform physically and mentally the next day. Um, so it's just this snowball effect in the wrong direction when, you know, you're putting these inflammatory substances into your system and, you know, exercise for me, sauna sessions, cold exposure, all of that has fueled that same feeling that I used to get from abusing alcohol. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it fueled, it fuels me feeling, you know, like I am, uh, vulnerable and that I can just express exactly who I am, you know, not caring about the public perception. And I feel like that's why a lot of people use alcohol is because it fuels that. And also, you know, it's a social thing, but for me, exercise is a social thing. Having people come over here to, um, sit in the sauna and do the cold exposure, the contrast therapy, that's a social thing for me. Um, we have friends over often that we barbecue for in the evening. We do these community cold plunges and community workouts and community rocks. So I get all of my human connection fix in mm -hmm. from those things that I'm super passionate about. So yeah, just, they went by the wayside of drinking, going to bars, even mm -hmm. going to, to cafes. I still love coffee, but I really feel like for me, the most powerful social connection tool is either bonding with someone over or exercise or bonding with someone in the sauna and, and, the, and the cold. 
Yeah. And that shared experience of it, there's something about that in our human nature. It's like you push yourself uh, uh, when you're exercising or you push yourself in the sauna and that little bit of suffering creates a, a bond that perhaps going drinking doesn't create. Definitely. Can't yeah. agree more. Yeah, yeah. It's just very, it's such a superficial fun. And I feel like the when you bond with someone over something you're both really passionate about and, you know, something that yields some kind of discomfort or there's an obstacle with it, mm. like those bonds are so much stronger than having drinks with someone. Yeah, it is. This, I'm, I'm 45 now. When I turned 45, um, I decided to shift my birthdays. There's no birthday dinner anymore, anything like that. It's a birthday uh, expedition. And this year we went down to Costa Rica with two guys and we climbed the highest uh, mountain in Costa Rica. But unbeknownst to us, it was the, first, the, the worst weekend for rain and weather. And they closed the mountain the next day, but we froze for two days straight, but had such a great time doing it. And so the three of us are now you know, pretty tight just from that one, that one expedition. Yeah, it's such a memory that is etched mm. into your minds from sharing that discomfort and then ultimately, you know, prevailing. And uh, yeah, every yeah, it's, it's, it produces this incredible feeling when you when you share that with others. It certainly does. And also going back to the alcohol thing, it, I was once um, back in Canada I used to work for the Canadian Olympic teams, uh, speed skating mainly, and we had this lecture from a physiologist who was working with the Navy SEALs. And he would take their blood draws for measure hormones and things. And every Monday, their hormones were, were out of whack. And he couldn't, he couldn't figure it out why until he asked what they were doing on the Saturdays, the Friday or Saturday nights. And they would work when they weren't on um, missions or whatever. They would work nine, nine to five, Monday to Friday. So Friday night came around, they would all go boozing. And they were booze like Navy SEALs but booze. And so it was pretty, uh, they said pretty big sessions, but 96 hours later, their testosterone levels were still depleted. And so all the workouts they did on Monday, uh, so if they work out on street Sunday as well, but Monday were a waste of time. And I yeah. remember this lecture and I was like, okay, you got a 96 hour sort of recovery from one session. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. It just, again, it fuels the, that snowball effect in the wrong direction. It does, doesn't it? So we've already touched on the community aspect of things, but there's one piece that I'm not quite we're quite sure on is how did you maybe you answered this already but I want to just double check how did you go from having a following on Facebook to uh, actually having these brands approach you and knowing what to do with them yeah I mean it was an evolution of um, you know brands reach well but it, first it was providing enough value to garner mm. attention and to garner interest and to garner people continuing to turn it tune in and i always tell people that are just getting started and building a personal brand go narrow and deep like you want to be known for something something very very niche um, I have a buddy who goes into grocery stores. He, you know, nutritionist, personal trainer. He goes into grocery stores, picks up a food product and talks about why he thinks that's a good thing to buy or not buy. Mm -hmm. And like, you know exactly what you're getting when you tune into his content, but there's this element of surprise every day and that you don't know what that next food item is going to mm -hmm. be. So I think that's the best way to build a following now with just so much noise out there and everyone wanting to command attention is being known for something and going so narrow and deep in that, that, you know, you are the expert and you are known for that one thing. Um, once, once that happens, you know, all brands are looking for um, eyeballs. They're, they're looking for an audience. So, you know, if you can command attention, there's always going to be money. If you can command attention, whether it's on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, billboards, radio, whatever, you know, it's something that brands have always paid for. Um, so, you know, once you have garnered enough attention, brands are going to take notice in that. And then I think it's, it's your role to figure out how you can add the most value. And, you know, I figured that out, leveraging my social capital, leveraging um, all of the connections I've made over time, leveraging my ability to produce unique content um, and leveraging my ability to connect people. And, and that is what I'm able to monetize. And for each person, that's different. You know, mm -hmm. someone might be able to create really cinematic content that, you know, people respond well to and brands want for their feed. So that's the direction that that person should go. And, you know, maybe once you garner the attention, you come out with your own product or service. Um, so I, I think it's, 
you know, up to the individual to figure out where they can provide the most value and also what they enjoy doing. Like I, I have been conscious of not coming out with my own product or service because I really, really like certain roles in entrepreneurship. Um, I don't like managing people. I don't like, you know, dealing with customer service. So, you know, for those reasons, I've decided to just wear this hat of, I just want to be the marketing arm for companies. Um, I just want to connect people. I just want to host community events. This is where I feel like I can add the most value. And these are the things that I enjoy the most. So I think you need to figure that out over time is like, what do you enjoy doing and what can only you do and you do best? Great advice. And what, what advice would you have for someone who's potentially where you were when you were early 20s, but wants to physically uh, and emotionally uh, and maybe even spiritually be where you are now? Like, what's their road look like? How, how can you help them? Yeah, I think first is, you know, you need to figure out financially how to how you're going to live your life. So, you know, early on, I think it's important to build an asset and pick an opportunity where you can build residual income, especially mm -hmm. if that first chapter of your life is not exactly, you know, what you want to be doing for your entire life, you know, figure out how to set yourself up for future success, um, figure out how to set yourself up to have the freedom to be able to start exploring other things. You know, that's, that's the opportunity that my father gave me was, you know, this, being able to build my insurance business where it was an asset and residual income that then allowed me to start taking risks. And then by taking various risks, I was able to create, you know, enough sustainable income that I could figure out really how I wanted to structure my days. And I've since been able to, you know, monetize how I structure my days with, you know, exercise and recovery protocols. Um, so yeah, building an asset, creating residual income, um, making enough time and space for yourself to have the mental clarity to understand what your perfect day is. And then, you know, building the perfect day. And once you've built the perfect day, oh, okay, how can I now monetize this too? I love it. So perfect. Yeah. Building the perfect day and that perfect day might just start with a perfect morning, you know, yeah. and, and then over time it ends up as a perfect day and then you end up perfect weeks and perfect months. You got it. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to, to talk about when it comes to using lifestyle as your medicine? Is there anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to share? Um, no, I mean, I think we'll, I'll go back to the very first thing that you asked me about, you know, that first tenant. I think that um, exercise is movement is something that you should start with. That's what I started with. Mm -hmm. And that led to so many other positive behaviors and ultimately led to having this, you know, cup that was overflowing so I could, you know, impact others and create opportunities for myself. So I think that's a great place to start is just like really dialing in uh, a structure of movement. And that could be playing tennis. That could be, um, you know, the, the things I do are things I enjoy. Yeah. It's not a checklist item. I don't wake up in the morning dreading my CrossFit workout or dreading that trail run. I love them. So I think it's important to think, pick things that mm -hmm. you enjoy doing and you enjoy the people that you're doing it with. And, you know, environmentally it, it fits for you. You know, if you pick a gym, that's three hours away, you know, that's creating a major obstacle of, of getting there on a regular basis. If you pick mountain biking and mountain biking is, you know, in another state, then, you know, that's difficult to build into a routine. So I think it's important to pick things that, you know, are, are low hanging fruit to get you to move on a regular basis. I think that's brilliant. Eric, I think we can wrap it up on that uh, on that advice. So thank you so much for being a guest on the show. I think people are going to really enjoy the nuggets that you've given them through this uh, through this podcast. And on each one of those tenets of lifestyle medicine, there's some very actionable points. So I really appreciate your insight. This is great chatting with you, Edward. And uh, if anyone has further questions, please feel free to reach out to me on uh, on Instagram. I love chatting about this stuff and love helping other people. Yeah, I'll put your Instagram handle wherever I'm going to put this uh, program as well. Cool. Thanks, Edward. Thank you. Thank you for joining me in my conversation with Eric Hinman. If you're enjoying listening to and learning from this podcast, please leave a comment and or suggestion for future podcast guests that you'd like me to feature. In addition, on Apple, you can leave me a five-star review and leave me a comment there as well. 
Now, if you want my direct help with something, you can send me an email, ed at edpaget.com or visit my website, edpaget.com. And lastly, but not least, I want to thank you for your interest in lifestyle medicine.